In this plenary session, the Law Fact has chosen to drill down and deeper into the work of a specific exemplar, rather than to summarize several more likely. Concerning the presentation you are about to hear, let me say only the following. I was privileged with other members of the Law Fact to witness the power and promise of this exemplar on the ground behind the walls of a high security prison. It speaks eloquently to the far better horizon law and justice should seek while reminding us tellingly and poignantly how long that journey is and how far we have yet to travel. That in this century, surely justice must promote restoration rather than only retribution. That from this restorative intent must come personal and societal reconciliation. And that in the end, nothing sits closer to the success and potency of that seminal transformation than love and forgiveness. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Mr. Jacques Verdun. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I would like to th uh, thank the Fetzer Institute for uh, supporting love in action. Let's just put it simple. And I would like to thank the FACT Committee, the Law Committee, as well. Um, these aren't lawyers. You know, we have different feelings about lawyers. These are warriors for justice and um, working in all kinds of terrains and standing up for justice often means standing alone. So I'm the director of the Inside Out nonprofit organization. Inside Out does three things. It has pioneered innovative prison rehabilitation programs. It's uh, leading the movement in prison reform. And it's also supporting a unlikely posse of bodhisattvas, namely former life sentenced men that are going out giving back to the communities they've taken from you know, teaching what they've learned on their side of the pipeline to uh, youngsters on the other side of the pipeline. So 17 years ago, I went into San Quentin State Prison to do an experiment. I wanted to know if love, forgiveness, and compassion would hold up in a maximum security hellhole where you know, there's 720 plus people on death row. 17 years later, as I'm happy to say, that with the help of a squadron of hundreds of volunteers and many other organizations, San Quentin, though still a notorious prison, uh, has also become a beacon of light. It's a place where healing happens, it's a rehab university, and it is a place that has transformed violence and suffering into healing and learning. And I would like anybody who is interested uh, to be, feel welcome to come visit us at San Quentin. I've developed a technology of transformation called leaving prison before you get out. Uh, that relates both to the prison that we're all doing time on, the one between our ears, as to uh, a very practical approach to healing and learning. Um, it's meant as not just a geographical fact, as you know, which side of the prison gate am I, but very much as a state of mind. Viktor Frankl talked about the last human freedom, which is that they can take anything away from you, everything away from you except one thing, which is your ability to choose your response no matter the circumstance. And so this is the basic principle under the program. And when the men graduate, they graduate from being offenders into being servants. So when I told the man that I was coming here to uh, speak to you, they said, how are you going to do that? How are you going to be able to talk about what we do in here? And so they resolved to make a short film, a, a video clip. It's made by them. It's edited by them. It's probably the roughest cut uh, of the conference. Um, but it's from them to you. We're basically taking 52 weeks to study a moment that sometimes happens in less than a second, right? So there's a real strong commitment here to learn how to stop our violence. 
being so young and never get a chance to know who yourself is. So to come back and get took back to your authentic self and recognize him for the first time also help you break that cycle. I remember you saying that writing a letter on finished business and that I'm writing a letter to myself at the age of 16. Dear Payne, I have a lot to express as 20 years have passed between us. I am ashamed for the pain and suffering I have caused you due to the decision I have made. I acted out carelessly without consideration for self, family, and community. Growing up as a youngin in our household, we had vi witnessed violence beyond measures. Dad was an abusive and authoritative man. I can recall a father beating mom. I was too young and afraid to help. Over those years, these tra traumatic events caused me to become powerless and when I left home, I felt helpless and angry. And to restore my sense of power in my life, I joined the gang. The gang life seems wonderful on the surface, but emotionally and mentally, I was drowning. I was too ashamed and fearful of the problems at home. I am glad you have the courage to, to look at our darkest secrets and allow these painful emotions to manifest itself. I know you, you will never make the same mistakes I have made. Enjoy life and don't be too tough on yourself. You're a better person than me. I am thankful for you for giving us peace and not giving up on your journey home. Much love and self-care, your 16-year-old self, Tao New Pain. I, I really liked how, how he did it from the viewpoint of his child. And for me, it's been a struggle to forgive myself and, and look back at that person at 21, that man I was at 21, and love him. For what I did, it's hard for me to forgive taking another man's life. And it's hard for me to look back at what I was at that point when I committed my crime. To be able to look deep within and and examine yourself like that, that takes a lot of courage. And uh, me, myself, I, I still have a lot of unfinished business uh, and you know, because I'm responsible for taking a person's life as well. So it's, I think it's very important that, you, you know, for one to be able to do that and, and to just, you know, and mean it, that's, that, that says, that speaks a lot. I'm gonna go around and ask each one of you, how much time you've served? 15 years. All together, 13 years. 24. 17. 27. 27 years, sir. 23. 24. 14. 277 years served. Now, almost three centuries in the room between 14 people. So this letter is in response to Jacques' prompt to unfinished business and uh, a letter to your father. The last time we spoke, you were going in for surgery. I was six years old at the time. Dad told me I was a mistake. Tomorrow never came for Dad. He died on the operating table. I was not mad or upset with my father. However, I'd be lying if I said Dad telling me I was a mistake didn't affect me emotionally or take an emotional toll on me. I did not fully understand the impact of those words until I was much older. I now realize who I have become is a direct result of that moment in time. It was not until I joined the Marine Corps that I felt as if I belonged to something. I felt a sense of family for the first time. I spent the rest of my career trying not to let that family down. Mike was my unit commander. I guess you could say that I looked up to him as a surrogate father, a father that did not think I was a mistake. My entire team was killed on our last mission to include my cousin Dave, who died in my arms. 128 missions and on the last op, every one of them gone. My entire family, five men who I had known for over 20 years and served with for 10 of those years, gone in less than 90 seconds. So I walk around with a mask on, a facade. To do otherwise would mean I would have to face the reality that I felt so many people on so many levels. And as I sit in my cell at night, I can't help but think about what my dad said. You were a mistake. Listen to somebody like this gentleman who just read that letter. Uh, I've never heard more insight in my life 
and what I heard right there. Uh, that's what this group has, has done. It's, it's, it's taught me how these things are all, like, listen to him read that letter, that's connected to me. Uh, everybody's personal response to that letter, that's connected to me. I feel every response. It's just, it's, a, it's an empathy thing. It's, it's, it's incredible. What I'm getting out of this class is, is how to uh, stop my violence. I grew up uh, in a violent uh, atmosphere, and it's teaching me how to, to be aware of my feelings and to know when I'm triggered, uh, uh, when I began to lose it or go get out of control. Uh, and that's what we call imminent danger is when everything uh, speeds up, intensifies, and then the regret, usually it's too late. So I'm able to uh, catch it before they get too far. How long were you in that particular one moment? About tenth of a second. I would say a minute or less. Five seconds. Okay. Two, three? Three. About two minutes. About three minutes. Three seconds. Ten seconds. Four seconds. Two seconds. Ten seconds. Thirty seconds. About four minutes. So we have 277 years on this end, almost three centuries. We have 18 minutes and three seconds in this hit. In those 18 minutes, we could never, we couldn't get the, that back. We can't bring that back, right? But if you do the work in here, becoming emotionally intelligent, of learning how to stop your violence, learning how to be mindful and make wise decisions, you're helping people you've never met and never seen. There'll be youngsters that are challenged in their situation on the other side of this pipeline that you could reach out to and say, let me teach you what I've learned on my side of the pipeline. How do you experience love in a group like this? Or forgiveness or compassion? For me, I think love is about trusting and sharing and giving back. Well, I think love is being able to recognize who you are and being able to deal with yourself and come to like yourself and accept yourself for who you are. And with that comes the ability to love others. Love for me is unconditional. Um, <laughs> just having yeah. compassion, and we share a lot of love in here because we all have our stories to tell. This group is like a chain, and feeling that I'm a link to that chain gives me the ability to love myself as a link and love each and every other link in this chain. The love is, is having the highest regard for another regardless of the cause or consequence to yourself. I believe that uh, love is not just a weak, uh, sentimental emotion. I believe that love is the most powerful force in the universe. So in a lot of ways, coming to prison, um, this particular prison and these programs has saved my life in a lot of ways. everybody for being here it's like one good family oh thank you
Crimes are nothing but inarticulate pleas for help. What if we looked at crimes and violence, as Marshall Rosenberg says, as the tragic expression of an unmet need? The courts deal with the facts, and depending on your income, you get better access to justice or not. But when will we start, when will we start dealing with the wounds? When will we start addressing the wounds? The wounds the victims suffered, and also the wounds the man lashed out from. Where does that go, that unhealed suffering? On a personal level, that becomes sorrow. Sorrow is pain that has not been addressed. On a societal level, that becomes malaise. That becomes the deepening alienation we experience, the fear of other. We're all doing time. When one of us is in prison, we're all in prison. When one of us is victimized, we're all victimized. What if, like the poet Rilke says, what would it be if we looked at something terrible as something helpless that simply needed our love, that needed our care? And what if we organized structures and methods to express that love and care? We can do it. We know it. There's incredible knowledge in this room right here. I want to uh, talk a little bit about a story that happened in prison where I had a, a shot caller for the Crips, the L.A. gang, come to the class, and he basically sat there like that and didn't say a word week after week. And we team up the older prisoners with younger prisoners, shorter sentence men. And a, man, a young man came into the prison that he remembered from his time on the streets from a long time ago, and we paired him up. And one day he raised his hand and he said, I got it. I said, what did you get? He said, hurt people, hurt people. He said, I lashed out from my pain because I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to sit in the fire, burn clean and leave ashes. And so when I heard everybody else around me burned, and he said, I've burned a lot of bridges down that way. And then his apprentice, a 260-pound guy there for domestic violence, Brother G, raised his hand and said, I got some too. I said, what did you get? He said, healed people, heal people. He said, and I know, because this brother is teaching me how to live. And these men embraced and wept. And we all wept with them. So hurt people, hurt people, healed people, healed people. That was the program in eight words. I want to give you some statistic, and some statistics to expand this a little bit. So get ready in your seat here. Put your feet on the ground and continue to breathe. Because we're in a trance about what we're doing with imprisonment in, in the United States. One in 100 people is imprisoned in America. One in 31 is under correctional supervision, meaning prison, parole, probation. 7.3 million people we're talking about. That's more than the cities of Chicago, Dallas, Philadelphia, and San Diego combined. One in 18 males, I'm breaking it down for you, one in 18 males in America is in prison or is rather under correctional supervision. If you're black, if you're African-American, it's one in 11. It costs $50,000 in California to spend a year in prison. That's room, board, and tuition at Stanford. 67% comes back within 18 months. There are no programs. If there's programs, it's because the nonprofits do it. So there's some more serious stats as well. We have 73 13, 14 year olds tried as adults and been sentenced to die in prison in America. There are more than 500 people in the sunny state of California that have been in solitary confinement between 10 and 28 years. We're in a trance about this. We need to wake up and begin to address this because we are all doing time. So in terms of the part of doing time between the years, we've learned a few things in San Quentin. This is the more spiritual resourcefulness that has developed over the years. So what have, are some of the things we've learned? 
We've learned that entering the, human, the, the mortal coil, the human condition, means you enter a contract to learn how to listen. Uh, Tillich said that the first duty of love is to learn how to listen. And so we've, le we've learned to listen deeply. We've learned that our sentience, our feeling awareness, disembodiment, is, has an inherent capacity for wisdom if you just know how to tune into it. Something that sits under all the religions, perhaps profoundly expressed by the Carrera marble statue in front of the church with the pregnant lady with the world in her lap. We've learned that love is not just a feeling, but that it's a quality of being present. And we've learned that just as you bond when you have a child, when you bring in life, there's a bond when you take out a life. And that you can engage it. It's not for everybody. But some of the victim work we do is, is extremely effective. I got a call one night from the Attorney General's office if I wanted to go see a death row inmate because his victim had asked for a dialogue for a meeting. So when I read the case, I found out that this man had abducted a nine-year-old boy, had raped and killed him and hung him from a tree. I went to see the man and he denied everything. He wasn't ready, he didn't trust me. So I called the victim Maria, a woman of 58 years old, Latino, about five foot, being a cashier in a supermarket her whole life. And she said, well, you probably want to know why I want to see him. I said, you got that right. I have a nine-year-old myself. I can barely bring myself to go see him. She said, well, it's not this forgiveness thing. It's not like, you know, I want to go out and sort of be uh, somebody who forgives. She said, I want to know what were his last words because I keep imagining it. And I, thought, I, I think that if I know, then perhaps I can let go imagining it, no matter how horrible it may be. I told her, I said, you know, Maria, I have to advise against you um, meeting with this man, because I think it will be further traumatizing. And she wept. There's that bond, right? I said, but I'm going to come see you. So I got, when I got out of the plane, she took me to the spot where her son was found. We went to her home where she pulled out the articles because it was a national case. And she was clearly still very much suffering in her role. And I asked her to come and visit us in San Quentin. I had talked this over with the men and I said, can I ask her to come visit you? And please understand that if I ask her to come visit you, she's gonna wanna ask you the same question she wanted to ask her offender. She's gonna wanna know did you kill somebody? How did it feel? What were the last words there? What did you do? Can, can we play like that? And they said, if it helps her, yes. So we came in, and that's exactly what she did. She asked every person those questions, and then she'd say, thank you. And these men answered without any nonsense justification or detail, just the facts. And because it was the truth, the truth is stronger than the fact of it. And the room began to lift. And light became lighter. And then one of the men said, Maria, I understand you couldn't see your offender because it wasn't the right thing to do. He said, I can't see my victim. Would it be OK? Would I have your permission, please? Could I apologize to you? And she nodded her head. And he came and sat in front of her and apologized, and all these men followed. And she touched their heads and, and said, yes, thank you, thank you. And then one of the men asked for if she had perhaps a happier memory of little Charlie. And she began to talk. And I kid you not, the room turned into a party atmosphere. She was so delighted. I had to like drag her out of there. And so that's one story of what can happen. And it's not always about creating forgiveness. So that was Maria's story. And so um, 
couple of few things left. One is my own dad was a prisoner. He uh, was a prisoner of war. I grew up in Holland, and he was abducted as a young man to uh, do forced labor since all the German men were in the war effort, and he had a rough time. We could hear him scream in his sleep as kids, dealing with some of the trauma that he had suffered. And when the Berlin Wall came down, he said, I'm going back. And we all said, go back what? He said, I'm going to find my captor, sit down, and make my peace. And uh, he did. It's a longer story, but he came back a changed human being. And um, I'm his son, and this program is growing. And, and I want to issue a call to all of you. And there's been plenty of calls issued here, I realize that. But I want to issue a call to the practical aspect of love. And I want to invite you to go and, and find out where the prisons around you are and go in them. You know, cross the threshold. Don't be mistaken by fear. You've seen what can happen on the other side of it. You don't have to be trained, although we're happy to help you with that if you're interested. But come give of your presence. Even if you teach embroidering to you know, heavy dudes, they will be delighted with what you have to offer. So we've all been given, we've all been entrusted with a certain amount of suffering. Suffering that was ours to receive, suffering that was ours to dole out, and suffering around us. And, and the question on some level, I think, is between everybody and their God of their understanding, can I be worthy of that suffering, as Dostoevsky mentioned? Can I be worthy of that suffering? And what is it that, now that you're so drunk on love in this conference, that you can give back? Because that's the way you keep it, right? So, in meeting it with joy, creating a movement means mobilizing. And so, now that we've found love, what are we going to do with it? So my invitation is to, to get up and to begin to feel some aliveness in your body over what's perhaps a rather impactful presentation to take in on, on statistics and facts. So the question is, now that we've found love, what are we going to do with it? <laughs>